Good morning, Catalyst. I want to thank Pastor Barry for inviting me back. It's great to be here and see so many good longtime friends. I, I brought some special people with me, too, I want to acknowledge. So uh, back in the back, there's my daughter, Alicia, and her boyfriend, Seth. Can you guys wave? They both just graduated from Pepperdine. Yay. And also, I brought uh, one of my dear long-term friends, Marin. Can you wave, Marin? Um, Marin's from Pasadena, and she has been supporting us with her prayers, with her finances, with logistics for almost 30 years. And Catalyst, you guys have been behind us for almost 20 years, I think, as we've been out uh, serving Muslims in Indonesia. And you know, people who are out there in the other parts of the world, we cannot do what we do without people like Marin, without churches like yours, and we are so, so grateful. Uh, my wife, Chiho, can't be with us today. She just landed back in Indonesia after a month-long trip to India. It was a lifelong dream of hers to go and see Mother Teresa's ministry there, and she got to do that. She got to walk down the street in Calcutta where Mother Teresa first received her calling to the poor. And then she went into the home for the destitute and the dying, and she hugged all the dying people and prayed over them. And she had a marvelous time. She got bitten by a rat and got a rabies shot. So she got the full India experience. <laughs> but she's fine and she misses you. Um, I get to be here this summer to support my daughter now that she's graduated from college. Uh, she is looking for a job in public relations. She's looking for affordable housing <laughs> yeah, somewhere. in this area would be great, too. So if you have any ideas for her about job or housing, come talk to us afterwards, okay? <laughs> uh, but it's great that I get to spend the whole summer with her because right now my visa in Indonesia is at an international school. So I teach uh, mostly missionary kids, but also some local kids. And I love it so much. It's just such a joy to sow into these kids while we do our other work uh, ministering to the Muslims around us. Uh, I think this is my favorite year at the school. God really moved amongst our student body. Uh, they were hungry and thirsty for him. We saw some miracles of healing. Uh, we saw some relationships restored. And probably best of all, we had two Muslim students this year, and both of them uh, embraced Jesus as their Savior and became spiritual leaders in our campus. And praise God. I love being a teacher. Do we have any other teachers here? Yes, I see a teacher, a teacher. Good. God bless you. You know, I believe that one of the most beautiful things a human being can do is simply to love a child. Now, teachers, it's not an easy life, and it's not easy being married to a teacher. At least that's what my wife says. She says she doesn't like being married to a teacher. And she's felt that way ever since, um, probably ever since I made her repeat the second year of our marriage. That's a joke. That's a joke. Are you guys up for a few teacher jokes? So school discipline has changed a lot, right? I remember when I was a kid, we used to get spanked in school. Anybody remember those days? Yeah, when I was a student, I got spanked so often that my classmates nicknamed me Thor. Well, my full nickname was Thor Buttock. <laughs> I had a student ask me this year, Mr. Harris, uh, is there any such thing as a stupid question? And I said, of course not. Silly, what a dumb thing to ask. <laughs> I also get to coach. At my school, I get to coach basketball and soccer. And this year, my soccer players wrote me a lovely thank you card. One player said, this is true. Dear Mr. Harris, thank you for being my couch. <laughs> Girl cannot spell for the life of her. <laughs> but she has a good heart. She said her dream when she grows up is to join the Peace Corps. Ooh. Our math teacher got fired this year. Some people said it was because he was cross-eyed. Others said it was because he couldn't control his pupils. Hmm. Got to think about that one. Okay, no more teacher jokes. Um, but I love being a teacher. And I love my students. When you're in love, you'll do anything, right? 
And I know you guys might feel that as well, and how much you love God or how much you love the friends that you're going to be inviting to the Alpha Course, right? When you're in love, you'll do anything. And we're doing this series now on relational evangelism. I really enjoyed uh, watching online, got to hear Noah's sermon and then Henry's sermon. Wonderful. Did you guys enjoy that? <clears throat> so good. And one of the things I loved especially was how they emphasized that evangelism is all about loving people, right? And if you've ever been to one of those evangelism trainings that's about how to persuade people or how to argue, that's, that's not what we're talking about at Catalyst. Remember the, the word evangel, the word gospel, same word, right? It, it comes from the word that means good news. It's good news. And if we're telling people the message of Jesus, but they don't feel like it's good news, we're doing something wrong. And I've done many teachings for you here at Catalyst over the years. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit less on the teaching side and a little bit more on the challenging uh, side, although we are going to look at some Bible passages today. And the challenge I want to give you is how far would you go for the sake of love? How far would you go? We're going to be looking today at uh, a passage that's one of the most influential in the life of myself and my wife as we went to Indonesia because we realized we're going into a brand new context, right? New culture, new religion, Muslims all around us. We are going to have to learn how to change because if we don't, people will reject the message that we bring not because of the message, but because of how we've packaged it. Or because of the messenger. Think about that for a minute. Think about this message that we bring, right? We have the most amazing message. When Jesus came, he, he called it the message of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is here. Let me tell you about this kingdom. It's this whole new way of thinking. It's this whole new way of doing life. This is what we bring to people. And we all know people who are broken, who are hurting, and we think, yeah, you know what they need is they need Jesus. They need his kingdom to invade their life. But we also probably all know people who are just good people. Maybe your coworker is an atheist, or like my neighbor is a Muslim, <clears throat> and they're good people. Um, they're moral people. They're good to their families. They have integrity in the workplace. They're, they're good contributors in their communities. Do they need this message? Absolutely. Do you understand what this message of the kingdom is? When we follow Jesus, he gives us access to this whole new realm that's not like normal life. In this realm, there's the, the access to miracles, right? Miracles of healing for sick or broken bodies. Miracles of healing for wounded hearts. Miracles of healing for mental health. Healing for broken relationships. This is amazing. And not just healing, but freedom. Think about the freedom that this message carries. The, the kingdom allows us freedom from the burden of guilt over the sins that we've done in our past because God says he forgives our sins and washes us clean. Freedom from shame. Freedom from the power of addiction. Wow. Wow. And more, what about supernatural protection or supernatural provision? You guys have experienced this, haven't you? What about finding supernatural joy when you're in a trial? Or experiencing supernatural peace in the midst of a storm? Or supernatural love that enables you to love the very person who's hurt you the most? That's not normal. That's so beautiful. And that's not all. What about access to God? Jesus opened this door of access for us to talk to God like he's our beloved father and we're his beloved children and he listens to our prayers. And not only that, but he answers them and then he talks back to us and he gives us comfort and he gives us guidance and then he reveals things to us we could have never known otherwise. This is amazing. And you throw in that, with all that, you you get to go to heaven when you die? I mean, come on. Everybody would want this, wouldn't they? Even the good people 
could step out of normal life and step into this whole other realm of kingdom living. And we're just beginning to experience it, right? To experience it. Let's, let's just say, God, right now, God, we want more. We want more. We've tasted and seen that your kingdom is good, and we want more at Catalyst. We want more in our lives. Take us to the higher places in your kingdom and let us demonstrate it. Put it on display for the world so they'll see who you really are and how much you really love us. Come on. Who wouldn't want that message? And yet, so many people never get to that part of the message because we've packaged it in something that's so culturally Christian that they don't like or because they stumble over the messenger. Gandhi put it like this. Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Ouch. Ouch. That hurts, but it's so true, right? So how do we solve this problem of getting ourselves out of the way so that the people can receive the message and choose to accept or reject it based on the message itself? We're going to look at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 where Paul explains how he did it. And this was so helpful to Chiho and me when we moved to Indonesia. Let's read it together. Though I am free and belong to no one, Paul says, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like those under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Amen. Let's take a look. Keep it up there for a few minutes, will you? And let's take a look at this. First of all, let's look at Paul's purpose, all right? It's very clear what his purpose is, right? Verse 19, he says, to win as many as possible. And then at the end, he says, um, so that by all possible means, I might save some. This is his goal. What is he willing to sacrifice to meet that goal? Well, let's look at his position. Is Paul under the law? Now, Paul was born and raised a Jew. He was raised under this culture of Jewish laws. But when he gave his life to Jesus, he said that God set him free from those old Jewish laws. So if on the Sabbath day, Paul wanted to pack a picnic basket of ham sandwiches and go on a hike, he's free to do that, right? Is he free? Yes, he's free to do that. Um, But does that mean he's free from all laws? Is he free to do anything? No, there is still a law that he must follow. And he describes it as the law of, uh, from God's law, and then he mentions also under Christ's law. I don't know why he mentions that twice. I have my own personal theory on this. Paul, in other passages, talks about God's law like God has written on our hearts his law, right? Every human being who's who's ever been uh, on the earth has written on his heart this conscience, this standard law, right? When your kids drive you crazy, murder is not an option. But then he also mentions Christ's law. And we know that when Christ came, he said, hey, Jewish people, you know, you could get all those laws and put them into just two. (laughs) Love God and love the people around you. Could you just do that? The law of love in Christ. Paul calls it in another passage. And then just to make sure uh, that the people got the point, Jesus said, oh, and by the way, love the people around you includes your enemies. Love them too. There's nobody who doesn't get love. So Paul's under this law of, I got to do what my conscience says. I got I to do what love says to do. But outside of that, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. But because of his purpose to win people, to, to help them step out of normal life into kingdom life, he says, I'm willing to lay aside some things. I'm willing to put my freedom and my preferences and my likes and my 
schedules and my comforts over here in second place temporarily so that I can step into the world of this person that I want to see receive this message. So for a Jewish person, he doesn't invite them on a picnic with ham sandwiches. He eats lamb chops on a Wednesday, right? But for his Greek friends, sure, he can go on a picnic on the Sabbath and he can eat ham sandwiches with them. Doesn't matter. He's going to step into each person's world where they're at, even if they're suffering. He wants to step into their world, and Paul has suffered, so he can do that. For those of you who have suffered, (laughs) isn't it more comforting when someone comes to visit you who also has suffered, (laughs) right, who can empathize with you? And so Paul's setting aside these things that he likes and taking time out of his schedule to step into somebody else's life in their situation so they can receive this message. For Chiho and me going to Indonesia, this was really important, right? We knew we were going to have to set aside some things. So, for instance, the clothes that Chiho wore in California uh, are not the clothes that she wears when she's in a Muslim context. She sets that aside and she puts on their type of clothes. Um, we were not able to have a dog in our house. All of our Muslim friends thought dogs were dirty and cats were good. So no puppy for our kids. We got our kids kittens. Muslims also eat kosher like Jews. So for the very first day we arrived there, we, we said, okay, we will never have pork in our home. I know. <laughs> That's a sacrifice for some people, right? But we wanted our Muslim neighbors to feel safe, that they could come to our home and eat and they wouldn't have to worry about what we might be serving or how we were cooking things. We were willing to set these things aside so that we could enter into their world. And honestly, I think, I think it was pretty effective. When COVID lifted, my wife threw a party at our house and she invited all the neighbors and she and a couple of her lady friends cooked up a home-cooked meal and we served over 400 Muslims in our home that day. Why? Because they know this is a safe house. These people, they value our culture. Now, does that mean we could just do, we're, we're free, can we do anything? No, we still have to follow God's law as well, right? And so there were different times where we would ask God, do we have freedom to do this? Do we have freedom to pray with a Muslim? God said yes. Do we have freedom to go to the mosque and pray with a Muslim? God said yes. Do we have freedom to say the creed that the Muslims say? There is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, No. That's where God drew the line for us. So when Alicia was in kindergarten, there was a wonderful kindergarten just down the street from us, Muslim kindergarten. And we took her there and we said, we'd like to ask you guys, look, we're Christians. And we would love for Alicia to learn all about Islam, learn Arabic, learn all the prayers. But one thing, please, don't pressure her to say the creed because we understand that to you, that means she's now converted to Islam. And that's a decision that a five-year-old should not be making. And the teachers said, absolutely, we totally understand. And they were great. Alicia had a great time at that kindergarten, and she turned out to be one of their best Arabic speakers. (laughs) So we made those small sacrifices in order to bring this message, right? What does that look like in the American context? How far would you be willing to go here? What would you be willing to lay aside in order to reach the people here in L.A. Uh, uh, What about if you have a friend who's from another religion? Would you be willing to go to their mosque or their temple in order to spend time with them? I think about my friend Kevin. Uh, Kevin's here in L.A., and he takes a group from his church to the mosque, and they have a peace feast together. And then the next month, they'll take a group from the mosque to his church and they'll have a peace feast. And they eat together and fellowship, make friends, and they talk about different issues, including some spiritual issues. Could you do that? 
What if your friend's a New Ager, invites you to a New Age festival? Hmm. How far would you go? I think about my friend Pappy. Pappy is one of those people who's got a real gift of listening to God's voice and giving people messages from God. And so he's got a whole team that he's trained in how to do this. And every year they take this group to the New Age Festival. They even take this group up to Salem, uh, Massachusetts for the Witches Festival in October. And they make a little booth there. It says something like spiritual reading or something. And when people come in, they say, well, you know, we, uh, we love God and He's revealed to us by His Spirit things that might be helpful to you. Would you like us to pray for you? And they pray for people and speak words from God for them and people get saved. They've seen witches give their lives to Jesus. Could you do that? I think about my friend Carl. He was our co-worker, but working in the Middle East. And he always asked himself the question, who are the people least likely to be able to talk to a Christian? And by asking that question, he wound up one day having tea with the leader of Hezbollah, the terrorist group in Lebanon, having tea, talking about Jesus. Carl retires and comes back to America, becomes a pastor. What does he do? Asks himself the same question. Who are the people who are the least likely to get to talk to a Christian? So instead of preparing his sermon uh, every afternoon during the week from his church office, he takes his laptop to the gay bar to work on his sermon and to make friends. He ends up making friends with the owner of the gay bar, and then he invites the guy to come and preach at his church. <laughs> Could you go to a bar if that's where your friend wanted to meet? Or a gay bar? How far would you go? Now, where that line is drawn of God's law is going to be different for each of us, right? You understand that, don't you? that one person uh, might get invited to the bar and say, God, is this, do I have freedom to do this? And God says, yes, go. And he could go and have a drink with his friend and share about Jesus, and it would be fantastic. But another person, maybe a recovering alcoholic, <laughs> might ask God, do I have freedom to go? And God says, no, 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 no. Don't go to the bar with your friend. Why don't you invite him to play basketball or golf or something where there's l less likely chance you'll see alcohol there, right? The line could be different in different places. It's up to us to listen. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Let him guide us. How far can we go to step into someone else's world? Where did Paul get this idea in the first place? Uh, let's look at the next passage. I think he got it from Jesus. You know, how far would God go to show us how much he loves us? This passage answers that question. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Think about how far God would go to show you how much he loves you. You know, I like to imagine it like this. This is probably not true, but this is how I imagine it, that God's up in heaven talking to an angel one day, and he says, yeah, I love these humans so much. I keep trying to tell them through my prophets, but they don't want to listen. I gave them a book. They don't want to read it. What do I have to do to get them to see how much I love them? How else could I step into their, oh, what if I took on human form? And so John chapter 1 says that God, God's word took on a human form called Jesus. And Colossians tells us that Jesus is the express image of the invisible God. In other words, if you want to know what God's like, you, you look at Jesus. 
And so here's this man who can now model for them in, in humans' understanding what love looks like, right? How much Jesus loves us. So he comes and steps into our world as a human. But he doesn't stop there. He could have come as a human king. No, he comes as a servant. Human. A servant. And he doesn't stop there. He comes as a suffering servant. So that everybody on this planet will be able to know how far he would go to love us. And my friend, if you have ever felt lonely or rejected, isolated, slandered, gossiped against, betrayed, abused, or felt severe physical pain, I want you to know that Jesus went through all of that to show you that he wanted to come into your world and love you. I want to finish today by sharing a couple of stories about times when God challenged us to go just a little bit further. And in one story, things did not work out the way we imagined. But in another story, they worked out far above anything we could have ever imagined. The first story happened a few years ago. My wife, Chiho, had a series of dreams, like boom, 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 right after, one after the other, about a childhood friend from Japan. She had lost contact with him, didn't know anything about him really, but she had a dream that he was now grown up and he was interested in learning about Jesus. So she told me the dreams and says, I think God is inviting me to go find this guy because I think he's ready to talk about Jesus. And you know us, but we're, we're committed to following the dreams. So we said, let's do it. She flew to Japan, figured out where this guy was. He was now a doctor. So she bought a bottle of wine and went to the doctor's office and sat in the room waiting for her turn. And then finally she was called in and the doctor said, how may I help you? And she said, um, I'm your friend from elementary school. Do you remember me? Chiho? And he's like, Chiho, oh, yes, of course I remember you. Well, what can I do for you? I'm not sick or anything. I live in Indonesia, but I've had these dreams, <laughs> and I think you want to talk about Jesus. Are you interested in learning about Jesus? And he said, no. <laughs> and she said, um, you know, I believe there's a God who, who loves you, and he, he wants you to know him. Would, would you like to learn about that? And he said, not really. And she tried one more time. <laughs> She's like, can I pray for you? Do you have any uh, sickness, any problems in your family I could pray for? He said, can't think of anything. <laughs> so she said something like, well, here's a, here's a little gift. <laughs> if, if you ever want to talk about these things, I'm in Indonesia. Here's how you can contact me. Bye. And she walked out of that doctor's office, took a long walk, mad at God. <laughs> Why would you make me do this? Why would you make me waste a thousand dollars to fly to Japan just to hear this guy say he's not interested? You are going to reach out in faith in the next few weeks, and you're either going to invite someone to come to, to um, Alpha Course, or you're going to go into their territory and just try to be a good friend and love them, and it's not going to work out the way you thought. And that's okay. Because two things are happening here. Number one is my wife is learning how to partner with God by living a life of faith, right? Faith says, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know who told me to do it, so I'm going to just do it and see what happens. Secondly, we don't know the end of his story, right? We don't know the end of the doctor's story. I've heard many times that the average person takes seven times of hearing about Jesus before they're willing to fully commit their hearts to him. What if she was the first person? What an honor, right? What if she's number six and number seven was just waiting for her to fly to Japan? 
We don't know. You, God might give you three names. And the first person you invite says no, and the second person you invite says no. That's not meaningless. Maybe you're one of the people in the chain. And maybe the third person says yes, and you're so glad you didn't give up after two no's. Am I right? The second story, and if I've already told this story before, just pretend you never heard it, okay? <laughs> How far would you go to reach a prostitute? So we've seen many prostitutes come to faith uh, in Indonesia. We've had at least one of them come in our home and have a meal with us. <laughs> um, how far would you go? One day, our spiritual daughter, Mary, I've told you guys about her before, she was a Muslim background, came to faith in Jesus through a dream, came to live with us because her family was trying to kill her. Wonderful Indonesian young woman. This story happens after she had already gotten married. So now she's living somewhere else, and she called up Chiho and said, Chiho, I have this desire, this urge from God to go to the prostitute's hotel you know, the, the really bad hotel with the cheapest ones, the cheapest prostitutes, the ones that are, the, yeah, nobody likes them. I want to go meet with them and pray for them. Do you want to come? And she was like, yippee, that's my wife, you know, that's her kind of a fun day. <laughs> so off they go. And Chiho honestly was imagining that they would go and like maybe walk around the outside of the hotel and pray and maybe see if one person wanted to talk. But Mary drags her right into the lobby <laughs> And there's a, there's a woman who's sitting alone. So she says, okay, Chiho, you take her. And then off Mary goes down the hallways, looking in the rooms to see who's not busy. <laughs> so my wife has a long conversation with this one prostitute, gets to love on her, gets to pray for her. Mary talks to some others, and then they go home. A couple weeks go by, and my wife is praying, and she has this little whisper in her spirit, make a cake for the prostitutes. So she bakes a cake, she decorates it all beautifully, and then she's, she wants to deliver it that evening, but she's actually not feeling that well. So she tells Mary, I don't think I can go with you, but could you take the cake for me? Sure. So Mary takes the cake, comes into the lobby of the prostitute's hotel, and she says, hey, everybody, everybody, come, 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 we have cake. Come, come, come. She goes down the hallways, come, come out, come out, come out. We have cake. We have to eat the cake. <laughs> So they all sit around in a circle on the floor, and Mary's cutting the cake and serving them, right? <laughs> and as she does it, she says, listen, while we eat the cake, oh, first she says, this cake was from my friend who came the other, the other time. Remember her? She said, to bring you this cake to celebrate your lives. And as we eat this cake, I want everybody to share, share this. If you've ever had a desire, even as big as the fingernail on your pinky finger to do something different than this. So the girls start going around the circle, and one says, you know, when I was young, I always wanted to be a nurse. And the next one says, I wish I could be a teacher. And they're going on around. They get to the woman that Chiho had prayed with two weeks earlier. And this woman says, wait, 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 wait. I don't get it. Why would that woman make a cake to celebrate our lives? My life is not worth celebrating. And she bursts into tears. So Mary comforts her, prays for her, prays for some of the other girls, and then goes home. A few more weeks go by. And Mary says, oh, I think it's time to go visit the prostitutes again. And off she goes. She gets to the hotel, and she walks into the lobby, and it's empty. So then she starts going down the hallways, and they're empty. The entire hotel is empty. She goes out in front, and she finds one of the guys standing around and says, Hey, where's all the prostitutes? And he says, You're that woman who brought the cake, aren't you? <laughs> he said, After... The day that you brought the cake, I've noticed that one by one, all the prostitutes have gone home. That building's now up for sale. How far would you go?
I want to tell you what's about to happen in the next couple of months here at Catalyst, okay? This is what's going to happen, and I know it's going to happen because your pastors chose to devote the month of June to talking about relational evangelism. And your intercessors have been praying about this, right? And then you decide to start an alpha course for people who might have questions about this amazing kingdom life. Here's a place where they can actually learn more about it. And all of these things that your leaders have done here have basically invited God, saying, God, here, what are you going to do? And here's what God's going to do. God's going to do these two things in the next couple months. Number one, God is going to be moving on the hearts of the people that he brings to your minds. These people are going to start getting stirrings inside them about spiritual things. They're going to notice billboards they hadn't seen before. They're going to hear songs on the radio and have a new thought. Things are going to be swirling around inside them so that when you talk to them, they're more prepared. Does that mean they're going to say yes right away? Not necessarily. But God is going to be moving on people's hearts. And the second thing God is going to do is he's going to be moving on your heart, right? You are going to begin to experience what we experience, where God gives you an urge, a whisper. It could be a name that comes to mind, maybe a childhood friend. It could be a place that he wants you to go, maybe Venice Beach. It could be an act of service that he wants you to do, bake a cake for someone. These things are going to pop into your mind. And church, are you committed to living a life of faith? This is where you grow in your faith. You say, okay, God, I hear you, Um, but this is going to cost me something. I'm going to have to lay something aside to do this. might be my Friday night schedule. I wanted to go watch my son play basketball, and he's not going to be happy about that. Um, What do I do? Why don't you talk to your son? See if your son would be willing to let you lay this aside for three weeks so that you can go with your friend to Alpha Course. But God, I've never stepped into a bar before. This is scary. Or a mosque. Or an assisted care home, or whatever it is where God says, well, how about that place? And you're going to have to take a step. How far would you go to expand that circle of love? Can you imagine right now, if all of our circles of love were put together at Catalyst, how big that is? That's big. But what if every single person expanded theirs just a little bit? Whoa. Let's pray. God, we've heard people say that they believe there's a great harvest coming to America and especially here in Southern California. And we want to believe you for it, but we also want to do our part. We want to do our part. We don't want to let other people do it all and we just sit by and watch. God, we want to be in the game. I invite you right now just to take a moment and just listen. Say, God, you already have my yes. Talk to me. Maybe there'll be a face, a name, a place, an act of service that pops into your mind. Let's just take 20 seconds and just listen. God, we can't give anything more than what you've given to us already. 
setting aside these freedoms, these plans that we have, they're so, so small. We can do that. We want to say yes to you. And God, over these next few weeks, we ask that you would continually be speaking to us, continually be whispering to us and guiding us to those hearts that are ready. Mm. We want to love people well. And if there's anyone here today that you heard me talking about this message of the kingdom, and you thought to yourself, man, I always thought that Christianity was just go to church and be a good person. I didn't know you could have access to all of that. I want to invite you to do something today that's brave. I want you to tell the person that brought you or come up after the service and tell me or one of the leaders and say, I, I want to know more about that kingdom life. I think I underestimated Jesus. I want to find out more. Please do that. So Lord, we ask that you would continually expand the capacity of our hearts to love you and to love the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for our online service. Hope you will join us in person sometime. It would be great to see you and meet you. Don't forget to subscribe to our Catalyst YouTube channel so you don't miss out on anything. And be blessed this week. And as always, thank you, Jesus.